All right. So I'm back again for another one of my pop culture roadshow things where I talk about toys and pop culture items that I've collected over the years and some recently uh, and find out a little bit more about them to kind of learn something or other. Yeah. First up, I have this Pee Wee Herman uh, from 1989 shirt. It's in great condition and it's actually got the Pee Wee Herman custom label on it. And I never thought about who did this artwork because it was very distinctive. So I looked it up and the person who did the artwork for this is a guy by the name of Gary Panter. He was very much involved in painting, design, comics. He drew posters and flyers for the Germs, the Screamers. He did the artwork for the very first self-titled Red Hot Chili Peppers album which was called Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then he also began uh, working with Pee Wee Herman and he helped design the sets and the puppets and of course did artwork for clothing and other such things. This one's interesting because uh, it's just a random, uh, my ants are loose. Uh, and then there's a bunch of ants drawn all over the shirt. He had comic books, he created his alter ego, which is called Jimbo. He's a punk nuclear hillbilly character. He did a bunch of books for that, um, like seven issues of that comic book. And then uh, Gary Panter also, uh, after that, decided that he wanted to begin working in light shows. So he created in his studio, he decided to start doing interactive psychedelic light shows in his own studio and invite people in and they would be immersed in these psychedelic light shows. So that is what I learned about Gary Panter, the person who did this Pee Wee Herman shirt. This is going to go off today to one of the supporters of my American Bandito podcast. They bought it on my eBay page to help support the show. So thank you for that. Mary Poppins, the original soundtrack. It's one of those ones that opens up, tells the story or the synopsis of the movie, and then all this on the back. Now, I decided, I know there was a movie about, you know, there was the Mr. Banks with, uh, wait, was it called Mr. Banks with Tom Hanks? Mr. Banks with Tom Hanks. Yes, that's what it was, which was about the Banks family or the making of Mary Poppins. I didn't see it. So I looked up Mary Poppins anyway. Walt Disney in the, let's say, 1940s, I believe it was, his daughter's favorite book was Mary Poppins, which was written by the author... P.L. Travers. He promised his daughter that he would make a motion picture movie of Mary Poppins for her. Now that was, he told her that in 1940. The movie didn't come out until like 1964. So what took so long? Well, apparently uh, it had taken them that long because uh, P.L. Travers did not want to sell the rights to her story, especially to Walt Disney. She said that she didn't want to sell it to a studio that would over glamorize and sentimentalize her work. Not entirely sure what that means. But then what happened was is the 1960s came along and the royalties from Mary Poppins books that she wrote started to dry up. She got one over one by being offered $100,000 for the movie rights and uh, she got to be involved in the production of it. And apparently she was swayed by the guys that wrote the soundtrack, uh, I forget their names. Uh, I want to say the Sherman brothers, I believe wrote, this. wait, I can look right on here. Can I? Yes. Richard Sherman and Robert Sherman. The thing right next to me, of course I can look that up. She was swayed by the way that they wrote the song, something where the woman's holding onto the birds in the movie, feed the birds. Now, Miss, Mrs. Travers, which apparently once she started working on the set, she demanded that she be called Mrs. Travers. So, I mean, yeah, go for it. Damn, I love it. Take it over. There are recordings online of her actually in the meetings because she wanted to record every meeting to make sure that she could say this is what she told them to do if they didn't do it. And these became known internally as the no, no, no recordings because she would tell them no, no, no each time she disagreed with them in these recordings and in these meetings about the movie. She was granted final script approval but was not giving any editing rights whatsoever to the movie. And what's funny is, is apparently she turned to Walt Disney after the first screening of the premiere of the movie 
she turned to Walt Disney and said, so when do we start editing the film? And it was like, that is the film. So she was apparently very angry about that. Among her dislikes were the animated sequences, the Banks family home, which was a weird thing to be upset about, uh, the shift in the time period from what it was in the book, and uh, Mary Poppins' attractive appearance, Dick Van Dyke being cast, and she also said she disliked the songs penned by the Sherman Brothers. So she kind of just hated the whole thing. I guess that was a, a very succinct way of saying I didn't like any of it. That was uh, what I learned about Mary Poppins. And again, this is something that I'm shipping off today to one of the podcast subscribers. So thank you for that. I got a bunch of these illustrated books from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But the thing about them is, is a lot of them are by what turns out to be famous, like, illustrators. Like, the artwork in them is amazing. So this one here is actually for Yogi Bear by Hanna-Barbera. It is from 1965. Now, the interesting thing about this, uh, as I was listing these, I was marking down a lot of the illustrators and the authors of these. And this one kept coming up, Art Seedon. His style is really cool, but it's kind of off brand. Like, here's a picture of Yogi that does not really look like Yogi. It's, I don't know, it's, it's just a little bit, everything's a little bit off. They're fantastic and done very well. He entered the field of illustration doing corporate and advertising work at first. Some of his largest companies were uh, Philip Morris, General Motors, Hearst Publications, those were his clients. That means he was working freelance. They were his clients. That's amazing. I love that. But book illustration is apparently where he really got a lot of his work and really was able to experiment with his style. His first book was Three Mice and a Rat by Margaret Wise Brown. She's the one that wrote it, and that was in 1950. So that first book he put out was in 1950. This one was in 1965. He had illustrated over 300 books in his lifetime. But the final book that he did uh, was in 1999. The very last book that he made was a book called The Train to Timbuktu, which was also the last book that was authored by the person who wrote his first book, which was Mary or Margaret Wise Brown. And uh, that was the last book that he put out. He worked mainly in watercolor. So the style that I thought was more like cutouts, these are apparently watercolors or gu gouache, which I only just learned is pronounced gouache. I thought it was pronounced gauche. A lot of the books he did were just regular storybooks for like nursery rhymes and stuff. But when he did the like Hanna-Barbera or Disney stuff, while it was still cool, it always seemed a little off brand. I'm not entirely sure why they didn't have the Hanna-Barbera artists do these children's books. It's still really cool. So that is also another thing that's going off today to one of the American Bandito podcast subscribers. Yogi Bear takes a vacation. This 45 record of Fun Day School Songs on Peter Pan Records. Now this record is from 1965. I decided to look up Peter Pan Records because I remember Peter Pan Records. Now they, the stuff I remember about them is not that they were children's sing-along books, but that they were storybooks. Like they would be things where it was like recreations of stories. It turns out they did all those things. Peter Pan Records was originally a plastics factory. It began in the 1920s as a plastics manufacturer for the garment industry. It was called Synthetic Plastics Company. And they decided to expand their repertoire one time and include products such as dice, poker chips, and plastic molded products. They discovered that uh, they could press their plastic, leftover plastic and other things, uh, melt it down and press it into phonograph records. So why not take it one further? And him and his brother decided that they would uh, make these records. They started to produce them. And then they were like, why don't we just make our own children's records? So they uh, actually hired a band called the Caroliers who sang most of the songs. Then they had a band that was known as, and it's even written on here, the Peter Pan Orchestra that played the background music. So a lot of their songs were recorded by the same people. They would go in and just do children's songs, record them, press them, put them in little packages like this, and sell them. 
Later on, they uh, started doing storybooks. They also created subsidiary labels. Uh, and eventually in the 1970s, they created power records. So those are the ones where like, if you had a Superman record or a Spider-Man record or Batman record, and it would read along one of the stories, that was Power Records, which originally was Peter Pan Records, or it was a subsidiary of it. So, and they're still around making this stuff today. They've moved down apparently into uh, video and DVD and uh, making children's stuff still, still to this day. So that is Peter Pan Records, and this is the 45 Fun Day School Songs going out today. So that is all I have for today. Those are the things that I learned about some of the stuff that I have here. And uh, that's it. So long. Let's see. And look at that. Boom.